morning, everybody. Hi, my name is Jody Janikopoulos. I'm here at the Addison Public Library with Laura Winnie from DuPage Animal Services for number four of our four part series. And so lucky to have you. So fortunate that we get to record these on YouTube. You can watch it live on YouTube right now. Uh, you can join us on Zoom if you're registered. We appreciate you. Um, and definitely check out the recordings if you missed parts one, two, or three. Um, and we'll be also featuring this on our Addison Public Library YouTube channel. So good morning, Laura. Good morning. Thanks for having me back again. Absolutely love it. And I will hand it over. Wonderful, thank you. So today, folks, we are gonna be talking about behavior concerns. We're gonna focus on cats first and then talk about dogs. So common behavior things that we hear at DuPage County Animal Services and the advice that we give them, give people for how to handle them because we want everybody to be living harmoniously in their homes with their pets. The best place for a pet is going to be in the home. So we wanna make sure that all those wonderful pets stay with their wonderful families. Uh, and just as a reminder, we do offer webinars pretty much every Thursday night uh, throughout the summer. And for more information about those, you can go to our website or also on our Facebook page. You can also sign up for uh, the Animal Services Newsletter and get information that way. Hope to see you guys there. But without further ado, let's get started with our canine, kitty and canine concerns. So first we're gonna go through the history of the cat, because when we talk about cat behavior, it's very important to understand. It's a little bit different than dogs. Dogs have been with us for a really, really long time historically. Cats, not so much. They haven't really been part of our lives as intimately as dogs have. Uh, it's really been very recent that we've invited cats into our home. And that was thanks to Queen Victoria. She loved her cats and it became kind of a popular trend over in England. In addition to going out throughout the colonies and across the world, bringing cats into the home, which improved their quality of life. I mean, I don't know about you, but I would love to be a royal pet. That sounds like a perfect setup for me. You get all the great food, all the great treats, and you're treated like Burton's first cat. That's pretty awesome. Oh, since that time, so since about the 1840s, 50s, they have become one of our most popular pets. Um, about 94 million cats are kept as pets in US homes and around 60 breeds are recognized. Before that, remember cats were pretty much outdoor space, right? They were welcomed because of the rodent control that they did for us, but they weren't really brought into the home until relatively recently when we're talking from an evolutionary standpoint. So let's go all the way back and look at their ancestors. So. Most scientists agree that they came from Felis Silvestris Libica. So this is an African cat, most likely origin for our domestic cat. And they're a pretty tameable wild cat, meaning they're, they're on the smaller side, right? It's not like we're inviting lions into our homes. But at the same time, they had a little bit more predisposition to living near humans and taking advantage of the fact that where we had food, we also had rodents. That was their food. So that was pretty much the gist. As I mentioned, 150 years, 250, 200 years ago, we started bringing them into our homes, but we haven't necessarily domesticated cats in the way that we domesticated dogs. And the reason for that is we haven't really been choosing their mates for behavior. We've pretty much always been happy with the behavior. You know, they're our rodent patrol. That's their job. They do a really great job of it. Why would we change it, you know? Uh, so 96% of cats, even today, choose their own mates. Of course, there are some that is that are chosen for their specific breeds, but that's more due to aesthetics, how they look, 
than the behavior. So pretty much when we talk about the lion in your living room, we're being completely serious. That is a wild animal that has become cute, cuddly, and fluffy, but the behavior and the instincts behind it are still very, very much linked to those wild instincts in that we saw before, okay? So imagine what all we have for our indoor cats. We ask a lot of our indoor cats now. And really just a blink of an eye in terms of evolution. We want them to potty in a box and only potty in a box. We want them to sleep all night long, leave us alone. We want them to cuddle up with people on the couch, maybe even people they don't know very well. We want them to only take their food where we want them to take their food. We don't want them hunting for our food even if we leave it out on the counter. And we've asked them to change their territory from several hundred acres to not, just a whole lot smaller than that. So there is a lot of expectations that we place on our indoor cats that unfortunately don't always mesh well with reality, as we can see from this lovely photo here. And unfortunately, having these unrealistic expectations is creating a slippery slope. Uh, over 3 million cats are surrendered to US shelters every single year. And a lot of that has to do with behavior. So we are gonna talk about ways that we can work with our cats to make sure that everybody is living happily in the same household. Because the last thing we want is for cats to fall out of favor because that's just going to cause a whole new set of problems. Uh, shelters already struggle now, especially during kitten season, which we have, where we have all of those feral or stray cats coming in with their litters of babies, it will get a lot worse if we keep having these unrealistic expectations of what a cat should be, okay? So let's go ahead and talk about a lot of common issues that we see and what we can do about them. It's very important if you have a new cat or a new behavior, something that you haven't seen before, you want to make sure that you're ruling out a couple of things. So with the new behavior, we definitely always advise people when they call DuPage County Animal Services, have you taken your pet to the vet recently? And this is true across the board with all animals, because sometimes that's how they tell us they're sick. You know, they don't quote act sick, they just act abnormally. And that's their way to let us know that they, something's wrong, something's going on. Because cats especially are very good at hiding weaknesses. Again, that's that natural instinct from the wild. They do not want to flaunt the fact that they are an easier target to predators. And believe it or not, we are a predator. We are big, we can be scary. They might want to hide weaknesses from us even if they've been living in our home for years and years. That's just that natural instinct. We also wanna to look to see if there have been any environmental changes to the home recently or any social changes. Have you added a new family member? Has a family member left the household? All of these factors can cause acting out. Just like with humans, when something changes, we don't always deal with it as maturely as we would wish. Well, our pets even less so. Okay, because they don't necessarily understand why the change is there or that it's for the better. They just know that something changed and they don't like it. Now, if you have a brand new pet coming in, they're going to need time to adjust. Older cats, especially, or those that say were rescued and they were living either out on the streets or maybe in a home with just one person, they're going to need a lot of time to feel comfortable to get used to the routine. We have a program at DuPage County Animal Services called Bashful Buddies. And those are animals that are just a little 
they're more on the shy side. They're not as outgoing as some of the other cats. Potentially, they weren't socialized as well when they were very young kittens. Potentially, they did live in a single adult household for the majority of their lives. And they're just not used to changes in routine, changes in people that they deal with. So we advise adopters who are choosing those animals what to expect. And for some of the more severely bashful buddies, it can take up to a year before those animals feel totally comfortable. And it's very important for us to understand that and realize that, okay, if we are looking for a lap cat, that's something that we need to be upfront about ourselves, right? We need to know what we want so that we don't take on an animal that can't fulfill those expectations and then quote unquote fails those expectations. So it's very important to realize what you want in a pet before going out and searching for one. Probably one of the biggest calls that we get at DuPage County Animal Services is litter box problems. Oh, my cat, she refuses to use the litter box. She's such a jerk. Well, there are uh, several causes. One can be those medical issues. Is your litter box one of those tall sides or is it in an area where they have to go downstairs? As our cats get older, they're more prone to arthritis and it might hurt them to go down those stairs every time they need to use the litter box. Or they may not be able to jump into the litter box like they were used to before they were suffering. Are we doing our best to keep those litter boxes clean? Remember, cats are very, very clean animals. They bathe themselves constantly. So if you're not scooping out that litter box at least once a day, that's like never flushing the toilet. Uh, you know, you, when, especially when you're out and about, you don't wanna go someplace where they never clean the bathroom, where no one ever flushes the toilet, okay? That's really, really gross. Our cats feel the same way. So making sure that we're keeping that nice and clean is gonna help out. Also cats use their fecal matter and their urine to mark territory. So this is something that was very, very important out in the wild to help keep territories aligned between different animals, something that's a holdover. So if you have multiple cats and only one litter box, there might be some issues there with one cat claiming ownership of that area and not allowing the other cats to use it. So the rule of thumb is for however, however many cats you have, have a litter box for each plus one so that they can each decide on their own which one is theirs. Also, sometimes negative associations can be formed with litter boxes. So let's say they were in the litter box. Uh, you keep the litter box somewhere maybe you know, in the basement, maybe by the water heater, and your water heater is eh, not as great as it used to be, and it starts making noise. So now they're in their litter box, they're doing their business, and then they hear this terrifying noise. They might start to associate terrifying noise with litter box. So it's important to understand what is going on in the environment that may be dissuading them from using that litter box, okay? Scent marking isn't exactly a litter box issue because they tend to still use the litter box, but they are also using their urine to mark their territory. This can happen even with only one cat in the household. If there are cats outside the household that can see in to your cat. So if you have neighborhood cats and you have the window blinds open all the time, it is possible that your cat is trying to mark their territory and claim their space from these cats that live outside. Again, a natural instinct that we see. So what can we do with these issues? Well, like I said, we can consult our vet for our medical problems. We wanna make sure that we're keeping everything clean. And then sometimes, I didn't mention this yet, sometimes if we change up the litter or the box design, our cats do have preferences, okay? they. They have likes and dislikes just like we do. And sometimes if we just buy whatever litter is on sale that day, you might be getting a type of litter that your cat doesn't like and isn't going to tolerate. Some of those litters come with very potent smells that are nice for us, 
not necessarily nice for your cats. Uh, sometimes they have little crystals that are supposed to be odor absorbing. But if you've ever pressed your hand against them, they're sharp. They have sharp edges. So it's not something that your cat is necessarily going to want to step on over and over again. And eventually we'll decide, you know what? Not worth it. Going to do something else. With other cats, maybe even scent marking for those cats that are outside, you want to try to manage the environment as best you can. So block off windows, block off the view so that your cat cannot see those cats or even provide a litter box near those windows if you can. Another thing we tend to do because it's nice for us is we hide those litter boxes away. And I think it comes from this disjointed thought of, well, let's give our cats their privacy. That's a human concept, not an animal concept. They really don't care if anybody sees them potty. They really don't. And if you have a litter box that's in the corner tucked away in a cabinet, some of them are even like planter boxes, where the cat is not going to feel safe. Because if there's only one way in and out, then that's not a very secure location for them because it'll make them feel cornered and trapped. You might try putting it out in a more accessible area where they will feel more secure. That sense of privacy, that's a human thing. The animals, all they care about are the multiple escape routes so that they know if something bad happens while they're vulnerable, they can get away. Scratching and chewing are another one that we hear a lot about. They scratch for multiple reasons. One, it, it feels really good. It helps keep their nails healthy by removing the outer sheath. So it's like filing their nails down like we do instead of you know breaking it off or catching or something. So it feels really good. It is a natural instinct. This is another way that cats mark their territory. There are scent glands in their paws and by scratching, it helps embed that scent into the area and it releases stress. So sometimes during very stressful situations, maybe there's a stranger in the house, maybe there's a loud noise going on outside the home, you may see your cat scratch as a way to calm themselves down. Again, it feels good. The best thing we can do, we want to make sure that we are providing them with places where it's appropriate to scratch. So some cats prefer to scratch on the twine, some prefer the cardboard, some vertical, some horizontal. Make sure you have a lot of variety. And then make places that you don't want your cat to scratch uncomfortable for them so that they realize, ooh, I don't like this. This doesn't feel good. Double-sided sticky tape is a great way to do that. Uh, there are some scents that you can spray as well, but honestly, the double-sided sticky tape is going to be one of your better options because it doesn't damage your furniture, but it does make it an undesirable location. When your cat does chew in a, choose an appropriate area, make sure that you're giving rewarding them for that. Even sprinkling some catnip on the scratching post or smearing some wet food on it to get their attention, draw their attention to those places are going to help. You can also keep their nails trimmed so that they're not as sharp and they're not as prone to destructive tendencies. Or there are even little caps that you can stick on each individual nail so that they can't destroy anything. Uh, please, please, please do not declaw a cat because there have been some recent studies come out. It was very popular back in the day, but recent studies have come out that show the long-term effects of declawing and it can cause tissue death. It can cause severe back problems. It can lead to early onset of arthritis. There's just a lot of risk factors involved, not just with the surgery itself, which there are significant side effects and risks with the surgery itself, but also later on in the cat's life because you are essentially making the cat walk on their tiptoes uh, for their entire life, which causes problems with their spine and can cause arthritis in their feet, legs, and in their back as well. So definitely do the trimming the nail or the cap route if you'd like to curtail the behavior altogether. Otherwise, make sure that you're providing them 
appropriate places and treating them and rewarding them when they make those good decisions. Some animals are chattier than others. So some cats will scream at you. There's no really other great way to describe that. Medical causes, there could be something that's going on that they just don't feel good and they're trying to let you know. They could be hungry and they see you as the source of food. So they're letting you know that as well. Something else is wrong in general. Maybe they've lost their favorite toy. Maybe they were scared earlier and they're letting you know. And then sometimes it's just for greeting, like, hey, I'm going to come talk to you because you're my person and I love you and I'm just going to scream and meow at you all day, which does happen. It happens. And then also mating behavior causes some yelling. So if you haven't gotten your pet spayed or neutered, those hormones raging through them at certain times of the year is going to cause some noise. They are trying to attract a mate. Whether there's one in the house or not, they're still going to do it. So if your cat is screaming at you out of the blue, absolutely get to a vet. You want to check to make sure that there's nothing severe pain, anything else going on that's causing that noise. Otherwise, investigate what's going on. Do they have a particular time of day that they're chattier than others? Is it right when you come home? Well, it's probably a greeting. Is it around three o'clock in the morning? Well, they might be bored. Okay, so we've got some info for what to do about that later. Also want to make sure that you're consistent with your behavior. Let's say that your cat is screaming at you to get attention. Then you give them the attention. Even if it's negative attention, even if you're just like pushing them away a little bit, that's still attention. So now they've realized, oh, when I scream at this person, she pays attention to me. Next time they're just going to scream harder, longer. And, and wait you out, okay? So definitely you wanna reward quiet times if it's an attention-seeking behavior. And you wanna to try to distract and get away from those other reasons. If they are food motivated and that's what they're trying to get your attention for, recommended to do particular meal times. And there are wonderful automated feeders that you can utilize. So eventually your cat is no longer going to associate you with being meat mealtime and scream at you. And instead they might start screaming at the little automated machine, which as long as it's in a different room from where you're sleeping at two o'clock in the morning, it's going to be a happier solution for everybody. And of course, to get rid of some of those hormonal reasons for the meowing and yowling, definitely spay and neuter. It also helps prevent other medical issues along the line, as well as any accidental litters. So definitely recommend spaying and neutering. The truth is, is that we're never going to 100% understand our cats. They experience the world so much differently than we do. Uh, they have an amazing sense of smell. They have differences in vision, in hearing, and sometimes we're just not going to know what the cat wants. Okay. So one of the biggest signs of miscommunication is what's called the belly rub trap. So you're having a great time, you're petting your cat, everything's great. And they roll over on their belly and show you their belly and you reach in and grab and pet it. And then they bite you. So it's not a love bite. There's no such thing as a love bite. More, it's a warning in that situation. Uh, little nips can also just be inappropriate play, especially with young kittens. They don't know that they shouldn't use their teeth on us. So when a cat is whoo, showing their belly and, and you know being all cute and cuddly, they're, they don't actually want us to touch the belly. It's more like an air hug. I love you so much. Look at my vulnerable area. Oh, don't touch it. Because they're very, very sensitive. So even the softest of touches is going to be overwhelming for them, which is why a lot of times you can pet twice and then they are completely overwhelmed and they bite or nip as a warning. Hey, back off. Okay. When you are petting, definitely recommend that you pause between petting because even petting them on their face, on their backs, um, even on their neck and their chest can be very overwhelming. Each individual hair is very sensitive. So imagine all of it 
being touched at the same time, very, very overwhelming. They can easily get overstimulated. So what I recommend is pet, pet, and pause. Pet twice, and then take a break, give them a little bit of a break. When they turn back to you, when they redirect to you, absolutely pet again, but give them that option. Let them initiate the petting. Don't just reach for them, okay? Let them initiate the petting. A lot of times when we see aggressive behaviors like that, oh, my cat bit me. They're not actually aggressive in the, in the sense that your cat is being your cat as a bully. It's often mistaken and it's fear, okay? So there are many different forms of aggressive behaviors. You can have cat to cat, if you have multiple cat household, a cat to a person or another animal. You can have territorial aggressive behaviors even redirected and redirected is probably the most confusing for us because we may not even see the trigger for the aggressive behavior. Let's say your cat has been sitting at the window around the same time every day. They know when you get home, they see another cat out the window and it makes them mad because there's a cat inching up on their territory. When you get home, you slam the car door shut, the other cat runs away you walk in the door, cat's at the window, oh, so sweet, go to pet, and they bite you because they're still upset about the other cat that they saw that you didn't even notice, that you didn't even see because it was gone by the time you got home. So redirected aggression can be very confusing for people because they don't always see that trigger. We also see aggressive behaviors in the play and predatory responses. Play is practice for what the animals need in life. And that includes fighting and that includes hunting. So a lot of times when they are playing with us, especially young kittens, they might be a little bit too much and it's our job to teach them, oh, that's not okay, that's not appropriate. So if you have a kitten that is biting, you need to one, remove your hands from the situation. Do not allow them to bite you. Redirect to something that they can pounce on that they can bite, okay? Toys, wand toys are great for this. We'll talk about that in a minute, ways to play with a cat. And we never want to punish them for that because again, they just need to learn that it's not okay for them to use their teeth on us. So woo, stop the interaction when they bite. And then the next time give them something else to act on instead. So when we talk about aggression, a lot of times it is fear motivated. So if we look at these two images, the one on the left, the little gray one, you can see this is more of a probably territorial response. So this is more assertive, aggressive. This cat is kind of leaning forward, the ears are forward, and they are dead focused on what's going on. The brown cat, on the other hand, is crouched back, ears are flat. This is a cat that has decided that the best defense, good offense, right? I mean, they are scared and they are trying to scare away the thing that is scaring them. So it's very important to pay attention to our animal's body language when we see those quote unquote aggressive behaviors to try to understand where is it coming from? Is it you? Is it another animal or another person? Is it where they are? The vet, very, very scary. Bring lots of treats. Try to form a positive association as best you can. Is it a noise? And remember, they hear better than us. So if it's the same time every day and then you notice the behavior, 10 minutes later, the trash truck drives past your house. They probably heard it way before you did. And it's a big, scary noise. So understanding that maybe they need a safe space to go to where we won't bug them when they're scared. You never want to reach under something, reach into their safe space and pull out a scared cat because that is a prime opportunity for them to defend themselves and you get hurt in the process. So to the best of your ability, provide them that safe space and leave them be. Cats also have a bad reputation for being jerks. A lot of times this is also seen for aggression. So maybe they ambush you as you walk down the hallway and they bite your ankles, or maybe they swat at you. 
Um, one of the favorite ones is you're fast asleep and all of a sudden you wake up because your cat has pounced on your feet and bitten your toes while you were sleeping. <clears throat> Excuse me. Maybe they're knocking stuff off of surfaces, right? They're just, ooh, they're being complete jerks there. But where this behavior stems from most often is boredom. So as I mentioned, if they're screaming at you in the middle of the night and they have a full bowl of food, probably because they don't know what to do themselves and they don't know why you're asleep and they want to play or do something. All cats need active playtime. It's going to look different across the age groups. So active playtime for a kitten when they're running around, jumping, going all crazy versus a senior that's going to have a little bit more mellow playtime they still need it. Now, automated machines like the laser pointers or the ones that you know flip or have stuff duck in, that's great, but it doesn't replace you. So you need to make sure that you're interacting with your cat. Work with their natural instincts, especially if you have a cat that has trouble sleeping through the night. One of the best pieces of advice I can give you, it works wonders with my cat, is we do a really good play session after I get ready for bed, but before I get in bed. So I do 15, 20 minutes of really good play. Then I give them dinner, okay? So for my particular cat, it's a squeeze up on some dry food. Typically, because this mimics their wild instincts, they're chasing, they catch, that's the play. Then they kill, also the play. Then they get to eat, so you provide them that dinner. Typically after cats eat, remember they're very clean, so they're gonna groom, they're gonna give themselves a bath, and then it's nap time. So if you're doing that right before you go to bed, they're gonna be zonked out, okay? By the time you wake up, then they'll be ready to play again. You also wanna make sure that you are playing appropriately with your cat. A lot of times we'll see people that are swinging wand toys everywhere or just you know, going super fast. Cats are ambush predators. This is true of all cats. So typically they're going to watch their prey for a long time before they go for it, okay? So when we are playing with our cats, we wanna think like the prey. So we're gonna have our cats watch us a little bit and then they're gonna pounce, then they're gonna watch some more, then they're gonna pounce some more. Okay, so as we saw in the video, vary your movements, but keep it in pace with your cat. You don't wanna be going so fast that they don't have a chance of catching something because that's the point of the game for them. When we have older cats, they might just be watching and swatting at it. That's fine, that's play. Remember, it doesn't necessarily need to be fun and exciting for you. It needs to be fun and exciting for your cat. So try out different toys, rotate them, find their favorites, have different things available and keep in pace with them. 
You can also see when is your cat the most active and start to work in a schedule. All of these things preventing your cat from being bored are going to get rid of a lot of those destructive behaviors that we see because they're going to be more satisfied with their life in the long run. So let's move on with our talk about dogs and understanding where behavior comes from. So a little bit different for the human dog relationship. There are a bunch of theories on domestication because 100% we have domesticated dogs. Sometimes we give ourselves a little too much credit for that domestication. Uh, the current theory is that wolves actually domesticated us. Uh, they, or rather they domesticated themselves. They saw the advantages of living with humans and decided to take full full advantage of it. They're like, oh, this is great. Let's let's move in with these people. They have food. And we never want to discount the role of genetics in the animal's personality when it comes to domestication, because those animals that naturally tended to be friendlier, were going to be invited in, we're going to be provided more food and have better opportunities to reproduce with longer lifespans and pass on those traits to their puppies through the generations. So that's one of the things that when we talk about, well, wolves domesticated themselves is probably the more personable wolves were the ones to make that connection with early humans in the first place. And we're talking about, ooh, 10,000, 12,000, 20,000, many, many, many years ago. Okay, so this has been going on for a long time. So what is the difference between dogs and wolves? Interestingly enough, they're pretty much all domestic dogs are descended from Canis lupus, the gray wolf. We do believe that it happened at least twice in different parts of the world. And because of the inbreeding, that's where we get all those peculiarities, not just with their looks, not just from the pug to the Great Dane, all the differences in body shape and size, but also overall, they're going to have a shorter muzzle than a wolf and they're going to have smaller teeth because they're not necessarily hunting animals anymore. Dogs are more foragers than their wolf ancestors, which were hunters, okay? But one of the craziest things that has developed over time is the dog's ability to read human gestures. This is something that we take for granted, that when we point at something, a dog looks where we're pointing. That's huge. Even our closest relatives in the animal world, apes and chimpanzees, they don't, they don't know what pointing is. They can be taught, but they don't instinctively look where we're pointing. Dogs do. Dogs have learned over time that when we are pointing at something, it means we want to direct their attention somewhere else. And that's huge. They can also read our body language. So a lot of times they know what we're thinking just by the flick of an eye. Like, I'm going to glance over at the leash. They're ready to get up and go for their walk because they saw us look at the leash. They are masters of reading body language because that's what they use within their own species. And they've adapted it to our species as well. Now, dogs are definitely a human made creation because we have selectively bred them for all sorts of jobs as well as aesthetics and size. So this is where we differ from domestic cats because we were definitely looking at specific personality traits when we were breeding our dogs. So the sporting dogs, the hounds, the terriers, the herding dogs, the working dogs, and then you know some of our toy breeds and our non-sporting dogs. We were looking for companionship as a particular trait. So definitely the most friendly of the dogs were bred purposefully for their personality. For our working dogs, we we're looking on intelligent dogs that can master tasks. So very different behaviors associated with different breeds. Today, a lot of times people will adopt from a breed because they like how the dog looks and not understand the genetics and behavior involved with that breed. For example, if you're going to adopt a working dog, for example, a shepherd, German shepherd, something like that, then those animals do best, thrive best 
in areas where they can be very active, where they have specific tasks to do, where they can be rewarded. It's not necessarily going to be the best lap companion dog to sit on the couch all day and watch television. These dogs have been genetically bred to do stuff and asking them not to, again, it's all about those expectations. So approximately 3 million dogs enter the shelter each year. Some are strays. Owners didn't necessarily secure them in a way that matched one, their escape abilities and two, their personality to want to escape. And also surrenders, people who just do not get along with the dog for whatever reason in their home. So understanding their needs, and their behavior and the breed is going to be key. Now, again, breeds are very important. They do give us general guidelines. Every dog is an individual though. And of course with mutts, it's kind of a catch 22 on what you're gonna find. So it's very important to do the best research that you can for the breeds that you're interested in to have a general guideline of what to expect. So let's go ahead and talk about some of those common behavior issues. Now, just like with our cats, we need to rule out the same things, medical concerns, environmental changes, social changes. New pets also need time to adjust because every change is a trauma. Even if it's to their forever home, that's still a change. It's still a trauma. They need to adjust, especially with dogs. The best way to do that, way to achieve that is routine having the same thing happen at the same time every day. That routine is going to make them feel so more secure when they know what to expect. Before we get into those behavior things, I do want to talk about dominance because this is still very prevalent when we talk about dog training. And unfortunately, this is where people read the original information, but didn't read the follow-ups. We'll just put it that way. Uh, it originated from a 1947 study on captive wolves. So wolves didn't study dogs, it studied wolves, and it studied captive wolves. Wolves that were taken from different family groups, would have never met each other anywhere else, shoved into a zoo, which in the 1940s was basically a concrete box, and then watched to see how they did. That would be like if someone watched a reality show like Big Brother and thought, oh, that's how all humans behave all the time. I don't know about your life, but my life doesn't look like Big Brother at all. It would not be a good test for what my life is like. So we should not expect that an unnatural situation in an unnatural setting with members of a wolf pack that didn't meet beyond, until they were there would be a good and also a different species. I mean, they're wolves, they're not dogs. Why that would be a good basis for our understanding of behavior, okay? The original study was refuted. And unfortunately, this idea that we need to be the alpha in our house that we need to assert our dominance and let our dog know their place in the household causes a lot of harm still today because it wants to use fear and force to get the behaviors that we want. And when there was a follow-up study done in the 1960s, it realized that even with wolves, in the wild, in their natural setting with their natural family members, wolves function as a family. They don't use fear and force to get what they want. It's a family setting, kind of like what we have. So the members in charge are basically the oldest members of the pack, mom and dad. They're in charge because they know what's going on, just like in our family. So the idea that we're applying something that's not even true to a different breed is very, very harmful. So instead, what we wanna focus on is called positive reinforcement training. This is gonna get you much better results. It is very, very effective. So least intrusive, minimally aversive, or Lima, Lima, however you wanna pronounce it, does not justify using punishment 
in lieu of other effective strategies. So punishment is your absolutely last choice here. You want to do something else to help your dog make the right decision. You want to focus on the animal's environment. What's going on? You want to focus on their physical well-being. Are they acting out because something is wrong with them? We want to redirect them from undesirable behaviors to the behavior that we want. When we are working with our dogs and we say no to them, no is a meaningless word to a dog. They know that no means we're unhappy, but if we are not providing them with what to do instead, it becomes completely meaningless. So that's why redirection is so important. We are showing them what, they, what we want them to do instead of the behavior we don't want. A lot of behaviors do come out of fear or unfamiliarity. So desensitizing and counter conditioning. So that means changing the emotional response to a stimuli. Something, for example, there's a dog out the window, I'm going to bark like crazy, okay? That's real fun for you guys. It's not, it's not fun for us, right? It's really fun for the dog to bark like crazy out the window, but it's not fun for us to have to listen to it. So instead, we are going to change how they feel when they see a dog and to get the behavior we want. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So for our tools for this, 100% make sure you have good treats. Just like we expect a payday at the end of, an, at the end of a work week, we need to be paying our animals for the behaviors that we want. Animals do what they enjoy. And if we're gonna ask them to do something that is not as fun, then we need to pay them something good in return. So make sure you're using treats and not treats that are convenient for you or that you think are good. Make sure they're treats your dog actually enjoys. Do preference tests. For example, the bone here in the picture, very few dogs are super food motivated by dry milk bones, okay? Instead, something stinky, something chewy, something gooey, do a couple taste tests. You can lay them all out, have your dog pick which one they want first. I'm sure they will eventually go for all of them, but look to see which one they go for first. Change up the order. They still go for the same one first. Okay, there's your high value treat. That's the one you want to use for training. And then pretty much just use it for training. Like, okay, when I'm working your brain, that's when we're going to get these really, really, really good begging strips, whatever it is that they decide on. You want to avoid anything that causes fear or pain in your animals because one, it will damage the bond that you have. And two, it's counterintuitive because a lot of times these animals are acting out of fear. So adding something else that causes fear is going to increase the behavior, not necessarily decrease it. It'll make it worse over time. You want to have items that provide guidance. So something that can gently redirect, lead, or limit the behavior humanely. So avoid prong collars, avoid choke chains. You want something instead like a front clip harness makes it harder for a dog to pull just because of how it's arranged on their body, okay? Using gates, things like that. Those are ways to limit behavior humanely without causing any pain or distress. Now, one of the tenets of positive reinforcement training is reward what you want, but ignore what you don't. That's great, except sometimes the behavior they're giving you is self-rewarding. They don't care if you're paying attention to them or not. So ignoring them does nothing. For example, barking out the window. Barking out the window is super fun and it feels great. So you ignoring them barking out the window isn't going to stop that behavior because they don't care that you're not paying attention, okay? So instead, that's where we do a lot of environmental management. So we need to prevent the behavior from being able to start in the first place. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So we definitely want to identify the behavior's reward, okay? So for example, this lady in the picture, the dog is jumping up on her. If all the dog wants is her attention, then ignoring the behavior might work. If the dog enjoys jumping up for the sake of jumping up, ignoring will not work. And one of the easiest ways to test this is to 
watch, to observe, to see what behaviors the animals keep offering over and over again, because those are the ones they enjoy doing, okay? When they do something correctly, we definitely want to reward them. So for example, when I walk in the door, my dogs sometimes will jump up on me in greeting. I do not like being jumped up on. So when I was first working with them on this, I walked back outside. You can also use a gate. Have them sit on the other side of the gate, stand on the other side of the gate. Once they are four on the floor, sitting, doing whatever we want, then we can reward them and give them that attention that they wanted because they're doing what we asked. Or we can use treats, having treats at the door. The other way is to ask for incompatible behaviors that you can reward, okay? So if the jumping up behavior is something that you don't want, we ask for a sit, we ask for a stay, we ask for a lay down, and then we reward those behaviors and provide that attention that they're looking for at the same time. Now, when I talk about using management, this is different from actually training your dog because you are trying to prevent the behavior in the first place, and it's the first step. You never want to allow a dog to continue to practice and get rewarded through that behavior. So stopping it before it starts. Nothing is being learned, you're just stopping the behavior, okay? This sets your pet up for success to teach them what to do instead. So for example, a gate so that they can't jump up on you, and then once they're doing what you want, you give them a reward, you give them that attention. There are many different types of environmental management that you can use for different behaviors, separating, having film or curtain over the window so that they're not reacting at the window, staying home if they're very fearful in new places. And if they are guarding from humans, from you, just leaving their stuff alone, not giving them the opportunity to react to that. A lot of times aggressive behaviors, just like with cats, is more out of fear. So we definitely wanna look at the body language. So are they hunched back? Are their ears back? Is their body lowered? Is their tail tucked? These are all signs of fear. When they decide that showing fear isn't enough, they want to be big, big, scary animals to scare away what's scaring them. That's when we get into reactivity. So the two most common types of reactivity are the leash and the barrier. So your dog is fine around other dogs at the dog park, but they go nuts when they see another dog when they're walking on the leash. That is typically one of two things, frustration, they really, really want to get to that other dog and they're annoyed they can't, or fear. Anxiety is a big thing for that because having them on that leash has now prevented them from feeling they can escape if they need to. So now they're going to act all big and scary to make sure that what they're afraid of will go away. Okay. We want to watch the body language there to see what is going on. Is the dog showing those signs of anxiety? Lip licks paw lift, other things. Are they just frustrated? They're straining forward. They really, really, you know, they're making those soft whiny. They really want to play. So when we're doing frustration barking, once we distract them from what we're doing, okay, so a good thing is the emergency U-turn. It's literally where you teach your dog to turn around when you call for them. Do it first in a backyard where there are no distractions until they have it down. And we'll show this in a little bit for loose leash walking. The other option is the look at that game where we change that emotional response. So let's watch a little video here. So she's clicking when the dog sees the other dog. The click means treat.
So that's very important because you are changing the anticipation of what they are seeing. So if the dog reacts very strongly out of fear to new dogs, now you're teaching them, ooh, when you see a new dog, you get a treat. So eventually they're gonna start associating new dog treat from human. And they're gonna look, and then they're gonna look at you for the expectation, okay? This can take a while to build up that association. So definitely stick with it, but eventually you will see the mental gears turning where your dog looks, then looks up at you like, hey, where, where's my treat? That's awesome, thanks. And you're getting rid of that fear, emotional reaction. Now, humping and jumping are also common issues that we see. It is not about dominance. It is not about social hierarchy and it is not about aggression. Humping and jumping are based out of a couple different things. It feels good. The animals have extra energy, inappropriate play sometimes and also just in greeting. So with this, we definitely want to ask for incompatible behaviors. So calling away, doing sits, doing stays, things that we like uh, before. Uh, sometimes we see this when there is extra energy. So making sure that we are getting a lot of enrichment for our animals is going to be very important. Having toys for them to use, uh, ways for them to work out those natural instincts, foraging, things like that. So let's look at leash manners. They do definitely need to be trained to loose, loose leash walk. You want them to be checking in with you. So when you are walking with your dog, reward them for looking at you, for eye contact, and also being next to you. So this is very important when you're teaching loose leash walking, you never want to toss a treat to them or hand it out far away from your body. You want a treat right by your side. You want them to associate being next to you with good things. It's also very important to understand that the purpose of a walk for humans is very different than the purpose of a walk for dogs. Dogs experience the world through smell. We experience it through sight, pretty much. So for us, a nice invigorating walk, getting out you know, our exercise for the day is the purpose of the walk. For the dog, it's the smelling. So we wanna make sure that we're giving our dogs plenty of time to smell because it is mental enrichment for them. Mental stimulation, mental exertion can be just as tiring as the physical act of moving around. Think about when you had to take a test at school, how exhausted you were afterwards. Same thing for our dogs. We wanna make sure that we're providing mental exercise for them just as much as we are the physical. So let your dog sniff on the walk. Don't just immediately pull them away. Sometimes even letting them decide where to turn, like, okay, we're gonna turn right at the sidewalk instead of left. Letting them determine what they want to interact with. Now, when we're looking at the loose leash, we need to train our dogs that checking in with us is good because they want to experience the world as fast as possible and they don't understand the difference that they're actually pulling us along. So an easy way is to use a slip lead, which puts a little bit of pressure on the neck to get their attention. You're not jerking it, you're not causing harm. You're just getting their attention. Now, this particular training trainer working with this golden retriever is not using food rewards. I would definitely use a food reward every single time you switch direction for them to stay with you. So the purpose of switching up directions is that they have to check in with you, right? Because you're going somewhere else. You want to reward them. So there he praises the dog for following Switching it up multiple times. Again, starting this off in the backyard where there aren't that many distractions is gonna make it easier to take it out into the real world where there are distractions. Have those food treats ready, okay? You are asking your dog to do something that's not as fun. Staying by your side is not as fun as pulling as hard as they can to get to the tree to smell the squirrel that was just there. It's just not, I'm sorry to break it to you. So you wanna make sure that you are giving them as much incentive to be at your side as possible. And eventually 
they'll start to realize the value of staying by your side. Again, nothing happens in a day. This can take a really long time, but it is worth it in the end, trust me. For barking, just like with our cats, sometimes it's all about being excited to see you. We want to reward those quiet times. We want to manage the envi environment as best we can to prevent the reason for the barking. Let's say they always bark at the doorbell. Then we need to practice maybe one bark and we get a treat or we go away. So giving an incentive for one bark, not giving an incentive for others. Uh, we are going to go through the next couple slides very, very quickly because I'm already over time. So bear with me, but you can always reach out to me if you have questions about any of these particular behaviors. Resource guarding is something that a lot of people struggle with because we have no problem guarding our own stuff, right? If I was sitting at my desk and someone opened up a drawer and started going through it without saying anything to me, I would be mad because that's my stuff. What are they doing with my stuff? Dogs also have a sense of ownership, okay? So understanding the history, have they had stuff taken away from them before? Were they in a situation where they had to guard the things that they wanted? Maybe there were multiple dogs all in the same room vying for the same resources. Us asserting dominance only escalates behavior. And what I mean by that is let's say that your dog is enjoying a bone, like this dog in the picture, and they start to growl at you when you come by. Asserting dominance says, nope, I bought that bone. That's my bone. I'm going to take it from you. Well, now the dog has learned that the growl wasn't good enough because the bad thing still happened. So what comes next when the growl isn't good enough? We want the growl. The growl is a warning. It lets us know that the dog is not happy about something, okay? That's how dogs communicate their feelings to us. We never want to punish that growl or completely ignore it. So instead of just, oop, nope, mine, I'm going to take it, teach, drop it, or leave it. Something that you can work on, not necessarily with an absolute favorite toy, but work your way up to those. And you're always going to want to trade up for something. So let's say they have a tennis ball. You're going to have them drop it and then they get a treat that they like, or they leave it and they get a treat for that. So this can start with something, one thing, but then you can practice it with multiple things to the point where let's say they get a hold of your shoe and you don't want them to have your shoe. Then you can give them the drop it or leave it cue. And then you can retrieve your item and you're not stealing it from the dog and invading their space. You can also just manage the environment. So if they get upset when someone's near them while they're eating, feed them in a crate. It's also great to feed in a crate to do positive association for a crate when you need them to be in there in that space. But don't mess with them when they're eating. Leave them alone. You know, absolutely, we want to teach other members of our household to respect the dog's sense of ownership as well. There is no reason for us to feel proprietary need over anything. Uh, sometimes we get the question of, well, my dog growls at me when he's on the couch. That's fine. Give him his own space. Teach him that that's his space. Reward that's for when he's in that space if you don't want them on the couch. Okay, there are lots of different things. And do remember that sometimes dogs have bad days too. Maybe there is a little bit of medical thing going on where they don't feel good and they're a little, little grouchy. We can allow our dogs to have bad days. We're looking for patterns here. Okay, and providing alternatives to the dog so that they know what's appropriate as opposed to inappropriate. Sometimes it gets a little bit too much, so we need to call in specialists. Now, this is more common for dogs, but can absolutely be used with cats as well. You want to research what their certifications are in, though, because you want to make sure that they're not using those dominance based behaviors or tools, nothing that's going to be painful or upsetting or fearful for a dog. You want that positive reinforcement, that Lima training. Uh, a great organization is looking at the International Association of Anim Animal Behavior Consultants. That's what Jackson Galaxy is here. And he just does it with cats instead of dogs. 
but they're all over the country. You don't have to go to Hollywood and specifically ask for Jackson Galaxy if you're having problems with your cats. Veterinarians sometimes have their own specialties. You can ask them. There are also simply behaviorists. These are veterinarians that have gone to additional schooling beyond the medical stuff in behavior. There's only a few in the Chicagoland area. They do tend to be a little bit more expensive, but for extreme cases, it is definitely well worth it. All right, folks, I am sorry that I went a few minutes over time, but we should have time for any questions. Uh, if you don't come up with any questions right now, here's my email address, humane.education at dupageco.org or our phone number, 630-407-2800. We are always happy to answer questions or refer you on to additional professionals. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Jody. do we have any questions in the chat box? Not yet. Uh, I do welcome anybody and everybody who does have questions. And of course you can check in with Laura uh, at her given, uh, station. But uh, I have actually a question about, are there any good dog sure. training books out there? Speaking of books at the library. Oh, that is a great question. Yes, uh, there are several that you want to look at. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, really, if you just go on Amazon and look up positive reinforcement training, then okay. that's going to be awesome. Also going to that uh, behavior consultant the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants, they also have a little resource area where you can purchase material from, I believe, directly from their website. They have great information as well. Okay. Oh, here we go. Um, so, hi, I have a cat who's about nine years old and I'd love to add a dog to the family, but I'm afraid he will not like it at all. Anything I can do to change that? So, just like with people, not everybody's going to like everybody. Uh, it's just a fact of life. So it is perfectly fine to want to add a dog to your household. You definitely want to make sure that your cat has a safe space that maybe the dog cannot access, okay, so that they can go there when they are sick and tired of the dog. You want to look into dog breeds that don't necessarily have a high prey drive, meaning those hunting dogs, okay? So the retrievers, the hounds, the terriers, those are all animals that were genetically bred specifically for hunting. And cats, especially when they run, aren't that much different from the rabbits or anything else that these animals were bred to chase and could cause some distress for your cat. When you are Talking about bringing in a cat, definitely think about the personality of the individual dog that you're bringing in. Make sure that you're looking for something a little bit on the calmer side. Puppies are great and they can be trained to understand that the cat is the cat and the cat's room is the cat's room. But also just older, quieter dogs are going to be less inclined to mess with your cat as well just understand that sometimes our animals will act out a little bit when we change up their social structure and that's okay. Do as much positive reinforcement for any time your cat is around the dog as possible. Save yummy treats for when maybe they're looking at each other through a gate and provide positive treats to both when they're looking at each other through a gate. Then progress, do those introductions really slowly, okay? Amazing. Yes. Uh, the thought of the hunting dog makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Okay. Another question, comment, question. Uh, can we do both during a walk? Walk and exercise and fresh air for us and also let the dog enjoy the smells. Can we divide the walk in half or simply walk fast and then stop for smells and rotate back and forth? So what I like to do with my particular dogs, I have two beagles and they are very, very scent motivated, is I keep up the pace, but when I notice that they're interested in something, we stop. So absolutely, there's no reason for only one party to enjoy what's going on. Also, if you do notice that your dog is very scent motivated, you can have little puzzle toys in the home so that they can explore those instincts in other ways and not just during the walk as well. So a great thing is a snuffle mat. It's basically 
just a bunch of blankets all tied together, little strips, and you hide kibble in between the strips of the blanket that they then have to smell to find the pieces of kibble to get them out. And they're foraging. So just like if they were looking for a piece of pizza in the grass, they are sniffing amongst the blanket folds to get that kibble. And that's a great way to provide for that instinct outside of the walk as well. Great question. Um, I have a question about, is, is verbal praise ever a substitute for dog treat praise? Is it just as good? That's a great question. So some, some trainers are a little torn on that. Uh, the proper way to do training, like the way that all trainers recommend it is you ask for the behavior, you mark it. So you can use a clicker like what we saw with that Weimaraner. And you can do that with a verbal cue or with the clicker itself, and then you reward, then it's perfectly fine to praise afterwards. When you're in training mode, you want your mark to come first. So we don't praise first, we mark first so that they know they're getting the reward. Some animals eventually, once they have that behavior down, praise will be fine, okay? You don't necessarily have to treat every single time an animal does a sit. That's a pretty basic behavior. It's, you know, not that, not that complicated. However, when you're in a more distractive environment, let's say you're at the vet and you ask your dog to sit and there's a lot of stuff going on and they do, I would definitely mark and reward there, not just necessarily use the praise because you are asking them to do something really hard in that moment. Good question. Great. Uh, what's your favorite cat toy? Oh, my favorite cat toy. Oh, I wish I had it up here. We saw it in the video and it is called the cat dancer. It is $2. It's great. So sometimes the cheapest toys are the best. Anybody that has a cat jump in a cardboard box knows that it is a piece of wire with some cardboard at the end. And if you want to talk about favorite toys for the cats, it doesn't even require a lot of wrist movement on your part and the cardboard just dances all over the place and the the cats go crazy for it it is very very popular at the shelter i bought it for my own cat and she loves it um she has even taken it from the shelf i have it on and dragged it over to me on occasion to be like this play with this toy this is the one i want so definitely test preference for treats, toys, everything to see which ones are your animal's favorite. And for those that are especially toy motivated, you can use those in lieu of a food reward when you're doing something. So you can always see what does your animal find the most rewarding. If it's a tennis ball, then after you ask them for a particularly difficult behavior, let them play with the tennis ball for a little bit so that they start to associate the behavior you wanted with the thing they want. Uh, I learned so much from you and you're so fun. Thank you very, very much. Thank you guys. Um, again, feel free to join us pretty much every Thursday night. We do a different webinar. Uh, this week we are doing more on animal communication. So there are lots of opportunities to learn. Oh, I do see we have another question there. Um, so I bought a cat bed throw and at the first my cat liked it um after a bit one day i saw he urinate urinated on it what gives so there could be a couple things going on with that that could be a scent marking i'm not sure if you have multiple cats in your home he may really 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 like that cat bed throw and is claiming it as his own he could also just be deciding like okay i'm done with this with my particular cat she really likes different she doesn't have a favorite cat bed. She likes different things to lay on all the time. Sometimes it's actually just a piece of paper thrown on the floor. I will drop a piece of paper on the floor and she decides that's her new bed for three days. And I don't move that piece of paper because she's decided it's her bed, okay? So the urinating on it, I, without knowing if there's a medical reason behind it, my first thought is the scent marking. Scent is very, very important to cats. And especially if you washed it and then they urinated on it, 
They're probably trying to get their scent back on it in the fastest way possible they can. Uh, at the shelter, when we clean out the kennels, we do not wash the blankets unless they absolutely need it because we want that cat to have that. It's a comfort ob object at that point. It has their scent on it. It makes them feel more secure in their area because rubbing their scent on things, whether it's headbutting, using their cheeks, using their claws, urinating, that's something that's a holdover from the wild where they had to mark their territories for safety. Now it's all about the comfort. So that would be my suggestion, making sure that we're not washing it too frequently. If they are urinating on it, maybe we are looking at spay and neuter or other cats in the area trying to claim the bed. As I mentioned, it doesn't necessarily need to be one in the home. Is the bed throw by a window? Can your cat see other cats when they're on the throw and he's trying to keep that throw for himself? There are lots of things that could be going on. Feel free to email me more with details if you would like. I'm happy to follow up if you need more advice, okay? Great. And again, Laura, your email is humane.education at dupageco.org. Yes, that's Great. correct. Great. Thank you again and again and again. It was a great series. Everybody, you can watch it again on YouTube, uh, Addison Public Library on YouTube, go to the channel and you'll see the videos. Um, they'll post right away. So uh, there's already three sitting there and now there's this one as well. So I would say that understanding animal behavior was a terrific way to spend time here. And I really can't thank you enough for having such a complete picture in each one of your presentations. Thank you again. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jody. Have great. a great time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you again. See you soon. See ya. We'll have you back. Absolutely. I look forward 